Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Just imagine how much oceans are important for us. We actually can't realize that water in the liquid state is how much rare in this universe. Away from Earth, it is usually a gas. The ocean produces over half of the world's oxygen and absorbs 50 times more carbon dioxide than our atmosphere. Covering 70% of the Earth's surface, the ocean transports heat from the equator to the poles, regulating our climate and weather patterns. It provides food in the form of fish and shellfish. About 200 billion pounds are caught each year. It's used for transportation, both travel and shipping. It provides a treasured source of recreation for humans. But what we are giving back? Plastics, oil split, carbons, chemicals, wastes, garbage, sewages. Well, assalamu alaikum. I am MD Jahin Khondokar, founder of Octofin, a scientific community where ocean-loving students from different places and platforms are trying to aware people about ocean. And today is the fourth day of our online live course, Exploring Ocean, Explore the Planet Earth. And we will know about the good, bad, and the ugly things of the oceans. Dr. Harunur Rashid is going to take this lecture. I am very much pleased to introduce you, Dr. Harunur Rashid. He is a professor of aquatic ecology and climate change research employed as permanent faculty member at Bangladesh Agriculture University, faculty of fisheries since 2000. Dr. Rashid is trained from Bangladesh Agriculture University B.Sc. and M.S. He got his Ph.D. from Japan and the USA Fulbright Visiting Research Fellow at the University of North Carolina Greensboro. Professor Rashid has co-developed and been teaching the following courses at Bangladesh Agriculture University, Oceanography and Marine Biology, Ecology of Fishes, Aquatic Ecology, climate change and fisheries, coastal and marine ecology, aquatic pollution and toxicology, etc. at undergraduate and graduate levels. Dr. Roshit's research and work experiences are quite interdisciplinary, such as aquatic stress ecology studies with fish and invertebrates, coastal marine pollution, environmental toxicology, climate change, impacts, and food security. He has experiences supervising researchers uh, related to fish ecology, climate change impacts on fish, aquatic ecotoxicology, etc. So far, Dr. Rashid has supervised six doctoral and more than 50 MS students. Professor Rashid has published around 50 research articles and book chapters in international peer-reviewed journals and international conferences. Well, dear participants, if you have any question during the session about the lecture, you can ask us in the chat box. We'll try to answer in our question answering session at the last. And if you are seeing the recorded file, you can comment in the comment section. Please enjoy the lecture. That's me at the end of my talk. And Dr. Harunur Rashid is going to take this from here. Please, sir. Thank you very much, Jahin. Um, good evening from Maman Singh, Bangladesh. Um, I'm in my campus now, Bangladesh Agriculture University a very rural environment, you can say, on the bank of the old Brahmaputra River. 
Today's lecture, as described by our host, Jaheen, is on some good, bad, and ugly aspects of the sea, of the ocean. I know that you already have had very good lectures last couple of days and had some good introduction on different aspects and lives in the ocean. Now, I'm going to start my lecture together with my presentation of the slides and going to switch off my video from now. Today's topic, as you can see, I've taken the title from an epic, I've taken it actually from an epic movie of the 1970s, the title, The Good, The Bad and The Ugly was a very famous movie in the 1970s. Well, it doesn't necessarily reflect the meaning of what it had in the movie, but I like the title. And now, let us dive into the ocean. You already know that ocean, it covers around 71% of a sub surface in this earth. It holds around 97% of the water in our earth. The ocean is around 4 billion years of old in age. It has an average temperature close to the freezing, 3.5 degrees centigrade and it has very deep apart in the ocean deeper than the height of the mount everest well i know that many of you know these things but i'm repeating this uh, for the for as an introduction of my discussion just to start with something with the ocean before going to the good bad and ugly the good I will talk about the ocean is the natural things of the ocean that we have as a blessing, the natural phenomena, the natural activities of the oceans for thousands of millions of years of evolution and in this planet Earth that are helping this planet, a huge life forms including the humans. Is this an ocean? No. This is a forest, a terrestrial forest, with long, large, thick vegetations and trees. In fact, this is from one of the largest, not one of the largest actually, in fact, largest rainforest of the world. Yes, correct you are. The Amazon. The Amazon rainforest, you know, is called the lung of the earth because the huge volume of oxygen that is required and necessary for all the life forms is produced in a huge quantity by the thick greenery of this rainforest. And as a result, this large rainforest occupying around 40% of the South America is called the lung of the earth. Very important. And it, it comes in, in the discussion of any conservation, any climatic discussions, the Amazon rainforest is so important for all the life forms because oxygen is life. But many of us, many of us have we compared between 
the Amazon rainforest and the, the, and the contribution of oxygen that we get from it, that the so-called the lung of the earth versus the oxygen that we get from the oceans. Well, the ocean, the term that I will use time and again, the ocean will be used to express the entire of the oceans of the world. In fact, the entirety of the ocean is, is a single connected water body. So by the ocean, I will mean all the subdivisions of the oceans together. So, okay, going back to the discussion of oxygen that produced by the ocean, the oceans, the ocean produces much larger the volume of oxygen that is produced by the entire of the rainforest in this terrestrial ecosystem. 28% by the world rainforest and much higher quantity and much higher proportion produced by the oceans is 70% of the oxygen of the earth. And this huge oxygen in the ocean is produced by nothing but a tiny, very tiny microscopic organism. Of course, it is a plant called the phytoplankton that is drifted in the water of the ocean, a lot of species, and these species with the chlorophyll that they have, like the terrestrial plants, they utilize carbon dioxide. The presence of sunlight, they produce sugars and oxygen. They produce sugars, they're carbohydrate. So they're the primary producers. They form the foundation of the food chain in the ocean as well, together with the production of the oxygen and also they utilize the carbon dioxide the carbon dioxide that is responsible for the global climate change a huge concern now and the, and the second very good thing that is served by the ocean is to regulate the earth's climate you know that in our earth there are places which are very cold and there are places which are very warm and if you compare the distance of different places of our earth from the sun you can see that the equatorial region are more closer to the sun compared to the polar region so the more closer the place is the more thermal radiation, more heats it receives, and water in this equatorial region are actually through this receiving heat, thermal radiation, they are heated more than the water of the oceans in the polar region. And this warm water in the equatorial region due to the proximity of the sun they are uplifted they are up wells because you know any liquid that is heated it is up wells and this as a result the two polar regions uh, they always have in this spinning art the polar regions always have the attractions to the pole. So once the water is uplifted, it is pulled by the North Pole and the South Pole towards the surface. And once this is pulled toward the polar region, the cold water that is heavier is actually went down. So two large whirlpools on two parts of the earth divided by the equator are created and this huge movement in fact transports 
the warm water. The warm water from the equator that is heated by the sun to the distant places on our planet. And this is how the Earth's climate is regulated. And as you see, together with the other factors of water movement that I'm not going to discuss in detail, there are the equilibrium. The valve tries to be in equilibrium of temperature through this movement of water, although there is not equal temperature on all places. But this movement of heated water from equator, from the far from the equator, makes a lot of our places livable. Not only the power of the ocean, but also these warm currents when they move along the continents, they warm the continents. That brings that makes the far distant and cooler region of this polar region regions livable places in the continents as well, not only in the ocean water. The third good thing is a very good thing. I know that all of us we like it. The fishes, vertebrates, the invertebrates, and the herbs, the plants, all from the ocean, they compose part of our food and very rich food. And these fishes, as you can compare, 1961 versus 2016, the, although our population of the earth has increased, but there has been a significant increase in the per capita consumption of fish and, and other seafoods. And, and, and the ocean has a significant share in this increase of the fish consumption. Not only food, but also a lot of the essential nutrients that we need are coming from the oceans, the food from the oceans. The omega-3 fatty acids, iodine, vitamin D, all of them are very good for our health. Sometimes they're essential for our health. Iron, we need them all as a component of our hemoglobin, but also they're needed for some of us need more than others, the iron, the calcium, zinc, and other minerals, some micronutrients that also are sourced a lot through the force, through, through the food we get from the ocean. And the food that we get from the ocean, the fish that we get from the ocean, the volume as compared to 1950s, you can see it has gradually increased. And 2018, the world's production of marine fishery from the capture was 84 million tons, a huge volume of fish, which is a rich source of our protein, are sourced from the ocean. A very good thing from the ocean for all of us. Another good thing sometimes is essential for us when we get sick, but even if we don't get sick for our well-being, we need medicine and ocean plants and animals, products from phytoplankton, corals, they all compose a lot of our medicine and, and nutrient supplements for medicine for antivirals that act as antivirals, medicine that act as anti-cancerous drugs, 
And very recently, for the SARS-CoV-2, the coronavirus that we call popularly, there has been products that has been isolated from marine products that kills coronavirus. So a lot of pharmaceutical products, nutrient supplements, are actually coming from the oceans. But in addition, a lot of cosmetics products, beauty products are also coming from, from the ocean, which is are also an important part of the pharmaceutical industry. Another good thing is that the people who love the nature, they love to conserve the biodiversity of the earth. An ocean is very rich and very biodiverse. Both plants and animals live there are very wide and diverse. So far, humankind have documented 200,000 marine species from the sea. But perhaps there are more than 2 million marine life forms, which most of which are not identified yet. Very tiny microscopic organisms like phytoplankton are hosted by the sea, but the largest animal like blue whales are also in the sea. A rich source of biodiversity are hosted by the oceans is a very important thing served by the oceans, a very good thing served by the ocean. This is an example of the USA, where oceans serve a large part of their economy. An example, a recent example by NOAA, together with what we have discussed, you can see the transportation is also an important part served by the ocean, together with recreation that I have discussed here for the sake of the time, and overall economy that is served by the ocean to a country like USA is 282 billion US dollar to the medicine, food, and other components that I have mentioned in general. This is just as an example. Very good things we're getting from the oceans. But what about the bad things we get? Well, the bad and the ugly that are from the ocean, that are to the ocean, are actually not by the ocean, rather are by the humans. So bad and ugly things that are happening to the ocean are by homo sapiens, the most harmful species for the planet Earth. And in this bed of the ocean, I will just touch a brief discussion on the ocean, global climate change, and how it is altering the ocean and only the largest influence of carbon dioxide will be discussed here. I will not discuss a lot on this because tomorrow you have a lecture on global climate change influence on the ocean. All of us are familiar with this carbon dioxide role in the global climate change, the burning of the fossil fuel, the industrialization, intensification of agriculture, deforestation, all the thousands of human activities actually are involved with emission of carbon dioxide. And that generates heat, global warming due to climate change. And this warming, the 90% of this excess heat is absorbed by the ocean. And 25% 25 of, the, of this carbon dioxide is absorbed by the ocean. So ocean, it helps a lot to absorb the shock of the ocean, shock of the global climate change. But of course, there are some consequences. The consequences are the warming of the ocean. The consequences are 
the acidification of the ocean. You know the carbon dioxide, when it comes in contact with water in the aqueous phase, they are converted into carbonic acid, which is broken down into bicarbonate and hydrogen ions, and then to carbonate and hydrogen ions. And the increase of hydrogen ions means acidification of the aqueous phase and the ocean water due to the increase in carbon dioxide because of the human activities and the climate change it has already the ph has already reduced to 8.1 from 8.25 it is still an alkaline ph but since the ph is going down it is called ocean acidification and all of you know it but the warming itself also has been resulting in decrease of the dissolved oxygen of the ocean as well and since 1950s there has been two percent reduction in, in the ocean oxygen level and this is mainly because of the temperature you know that any aqueous phase so as water when it is heated the it has loose bonds between and as a result the oxygen or any any gas that is dissolved in water is emitted so more cooler the water more oxygens are dissolved more warmer the water the more oxygens are released so as a result oxygens are released and very briefly the other effects well the warming you know that the anything that warms that expands that expands the material thermally so the ocean has been thermally expanding because of the warming of the globe and sea level rise is already evident because of this thermal expansion together with the melting ice bleaching of the corals the the phytoplankton that is in a symbiotic relationship the relationship with this with this coral colony uh, the phytoplankton zoosentally is withdrawing itself from the its symbiotic uh, animal colony because of this uh, acidification but also the the increase in temperature has also a role here and it is already evident that the, the toxic algae are in the in the ocean that are the result of a lot of fish kills a lot of neurotoxic shellfish poisoning to humans upon consumption of shellfish which consume uh, toxic algae are actually the incidences of toxic algae bloom are increasing because of uh, global warming because Toxic algae are favored by the high temperature. And a lot of habitats due to, due to decrease in oxygen. Sometimes there are hypoxic conditions, suffocations from the, for the animals uh, living there. And the habitat is no more suitable. The part of the habitat or the entire habitat is no more suitable for the marine animals to live. And the acidification itself has a consequence to the shell formation of the of the calcareous shell forming organisms, because the uh, the the hydrogen ion it can react with even the the calcium carbonate or magnesium carbonate and this is to see it um, and break them down, or they can they can react with uh, with the carbon dioxide. To form bicarbonate, utilizing, taking off, taking off the carbonates, and making the carbon dioxide and carbonate unavailable for the shell-forming organisms. So acidification, in many ways, are actually harming the marine life forms. And of course, the the fishery, uh, due to all of the reasons that we have mentioned. All of them have consequences on fishery and once the fishery production is compromised 
it has impacts on the livelihoods and of course if the climate change effects go on like this there will be consequences on global food security and and food supply uh, source from the sea so bad things are happening in the oceans and we will have consequences because we the homo sapiens are the reasons for these bad things And very ugly things are also happening. I will go detail in these ugly things. And of course, these are also by the humans. The ugly things are the pollutions. We love to dump everything into the water. Everything we dump from our kitchen, from our industry, from, from a place far from the coast, anything we dump, a lot of them ultimately find their way into the sea because there are transporters, rainfall, rivers and their tributaries, they ultimately are destined to the sea. As, um, introduced by Jahin, uh, actually. I, I have been working on the aquatic pollution, different aspects of aquatic pollution and their effects on aquatic life forms, including the coastal and marine pollution in Bangladesh. So this part of my discussion, the, the ugly part of today's topic will be mostly based on um, Bangladesh context. And Bangladesh, you know, is one of the most vibrant deltas of the world. It, it has, it used to have more than 700 rivers, but still it has 210 active rivers. And they're very active, particularly during monsoon. And a country in a vibrant delta, the Bay of Bengal Delta, is actually at the last part of the journey of the most of the rivers. And as a result, this country, among these 210 active rivers, around 55 of them are transboundary. Traveled a lot of ways. And at the end of their journey, they ultimately meet with the Bay of Bengal, bringing all the pollutants from Bangladesh, but also from the upstream countries, even far from China, India, Bhutan, Nepal, Myanmar, a huge pollutants ultimately are coming to the Bay of Bengal over through this huge Padma Magna Jamuna estuary. And first part of this ugly thing of today's discussion is pesticides that I have researched a lot actually. Agro-pesticides mostly that are coming to the aquatic system but could readily, could fast be transported to the sea. You know that Bangladesh, her agriculture is an important part of its economy and livelihood and these agricultures are mostly over the floodplains. The floodplains that are very close to the rivers, tributaries, and pesticides are used indiscriminately in Bangladesh and many of the developing countries. And when they are applied to the agricultural land for getting better production, they ultimately, the overdose they ultimately find their way into the river and in the monsoon, they could readily be transported to the Bay of Bengal, exposing the entire through this, through this journey, harming a lot of life forms in the floodplains, waters, in the rivers, and in the ocean, in the sea. 
and there has been tremendous growth of pesticide use, agro-pesticide use in this country because population has increased. We had to intensify our agriculture and as a result a lot of, a lot of chemical fertilizers and pesticides are being used and which are ultimately going to the sea. Well, this is a global picture. The growth of pesticide use globally from 2 million tons in 1990, over the last three decades, it has been doubled. 4 million tons per year. A huge volume. And they remember, a, a large part of this, sorry for the distance, and a large part of this pesticide that is used here, that ultimately goes to the sea. Let us see what about Bangladesh. Well, the world picture is doubling the volume of pesticide use over the last three decades, but for Bangladesh, it's increase of tenfolds over 30 years. It's tenfold increase. And it is a huge increase for a country and quite quite many fold at the volume compared to the other countries as you can see and among these pesticides some of the dirty dozens very harmful pesticides are still found in our water i don't know whether they are being used or not but still they are found and unfortunately the investigations Recent investigations, they found that the farmers of our country, Bangladesh, they use 10 to 15 times the permissible amount of agro-pesticides. And some of the persistent organic pollutants that persist in water and harm the aquatic life forms for a longer period of time, the six of them are still being found in our waters, in our, in our rivers, in our estuaries and seas. Now, I'd like to share some of my research findings and publish resources on the effects of pesticides in the aquatic life forms. I use fish and zooplankton as model animals, but today, for the sake of time, I'll be discussing the effects of pesticide on fish only. Well, in the laboratory, this, these fishes are mostly freshwater, but, but you can imagine the similar effect if exposed to the coastal and marine fish, the similar effect will happen. This is a research done by one of my PhD students that has been published in Environmental Science and Pollution Research, where we, can, where we have found that they, with the increasing concentrations of cypermethrin that is a that is a pesticide use in our country bangladesh there are increasing death tolls of embryos of uh, fish that we see a catfish that we have used here similarly when we use cypermethrin in the same paper we have seen the the embryonic deformity larval deformity some deformity this is a normal embryo this is an embryo that was exposed to cypermethrin and within 24 hours this kind of deformities are evident in this catfish another research that we have done with diazin on pesticide on stinging catfish that was um, presented in, in an international conference and a full paper was published. You can see that a huge accumulation of fluid, which is called edema, is, is an abnormality here compared to a healthy embryo. And deformity here, not a quote deformity, together with other abnormalities you can see in a sticking catfish exposed to diazinum, which is also 
a crop insecticide used here. And this kind of deformities, edema, notochord deformity, caudal, fin, caudal deformity, tumor-like structures with sumitium. This has been published in the um, Chinese Journal of Oceanography and Limnology. I think it was a Springer or Elsevier Press Journal. This was uh, researched by one of my master's degree students. And the mortality in the larval stage also, with the increasing concentration of sapermetrin, we have found increasing mortalities in the larval stage as well, together with deformity, together with significant deformities um, in the gangetic mistress as well. Unfortunately, when we have raised the fish up to adulthood to see whether the embryonic and larval deformities that has occurred due to pesticide is reversed or not. Unfortunately, it is not reversed. The deformity that has happened in the embryonic stage and the larval stage is permanent. This is a the healthy stinging catfish and unexposed uh, stinging catfish in the larval stage and embryonic stage, and these are exposed during the larval stage. And these fishes in the market, they don't have any value. The farm gate price is very, very low. And in the aquaculture, in the natural ecosystem, the fishermen's harvest all have a huge financial loss for those fishes from those fishes which survived but a lot of them are already dead due to the embryonic and larval exposure a lot of the embryon larvae are already dead compromising the natural productivity and and the some of the index of productivity the hatching rate it it indicates productivity when exposed to sapermetrin the gangetic mistress catfish, we have found that there has been reduction in the rate of hatching. And not only this, this life history traits, but also the very important internal organs like, like oocytes in the gonads, in the ovary, we have seen histo hist histopathological changes altered due to exposure to pesticides. And when we have seen other internal organs, very important internal organs like liver, we have seen pathological symptoms inside the fish liver that are exposed to pesticides like malathion. And another internal organ like kidney, pathological symptoms, dysfunctioning. We can imagine the dysfunctioning of these important organs will happen due to these exposures and due to these pathological symptoms. This is a research was done by another one of my PhD students. Uh, this PhD was was done in the Wagen Engineering University in the Netherlands and I was a co-supervisor co of, of uh, my the then student. He's my colleague now. We have assessed the risk assessment of pesticide in rice prawn concurrent system in the in the south western coastal region of Bangladesh, Kulna, where there is a shrimp and fish cultivation going on side by side or in the same plot. And we have found that these insecticides that are being used in the for the crops may pose high to moderate um, acute and chronic risks for, for invertebrates and fish that are in the plot of the pedi or in the shrimp gear close to the pedi field. And again, this shrimp aquaculture plot is actually close to the sea. It receives water from the sea. It drains water into the sea, into the Bay of Bengal, into the Shundabans, another critical ecosystem. Well, that was all about the pesticides 
and their effects on aquatic life forms using fish as a model animal. Now, I'm going to share some of my experiences, including some of my researches in the Bath Bengal and coastal rivers on microplastic pollution. You know that every day we use a lot of plastic materials and we dump them. Ultimately, they find their way into the, into the river. And through the river, they're transported to the sea. They're drifted in the seawater. They're suspended in the seawater. They're sunk in this, on the sea bottom. And they exert their effects. And the volume of the plastics that we, the human being, dump into the ocean is between 4.8 to 12.7 million tons per year. And this is the Ganges Delta, where Bangladesh is and where all of the deltaic discharges are coming to the Bay of Bengal. And this is one of the highly plastic polluted regions of the world where there are from 20,000 to 93,000 particles per kilometer square. So you can see the place, the part of the region that I'm discussing is one of the highly polluted regions with microplastics, with plastics. Plastics, well, microplastic is a popular term, but plastic according to their size, they're called nanoplastics, microplastics, microplastics. Well, and they drift, as I have told you, they float, they're suspended, they come in contact with a lot of um, abrasion, uh, with, the, with the UV radiation of the sunlight, and with the abrasion, with the wave actions, sunlight, they're disintegrated into tiny small pieces. They get ample time to, to get disintegrated into small pieces. They get 400 years, over 400 years in the oceans to get disintegrated into sufficient small pieces to be consumed by the aquatic animals, the fishes and other animals. But also plastics, easily ingestible and tiny small particles, easily ingestible by the marine animals, small enough for them to ingest, are released, are used, are utilized in the industrial processes, in the manufacturing processes, and are dumped. We use plastics every day, every hour, packaging materials, bottles, vehicles, our dyes, flakes coming out from the disintegration of the of the coatings. Well our our garment industries and, and the, the, the 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 washing of these clothes every day, tiny, small microscopic particles coming from them. The cosmetic products, the face washes, they also use very tiny, small particles, microplastics. We use them a lot. And they're so small pieces that they easily are drifted hundreds of thousands of kilometers by water, ultimately going to the sea. And the river fishes and the sea fishes, they eat them, they ingest them variety of sizes of particles that ingest them according to their food habit, according to their feeding habit. And they are found. When we research them, we find a different sizes, different types of plastics. But not only fish, the marine invertebrates, the filter feeders, very tiny small particles. 
could be ingested by the small invertebrates. The mussels, the wasters, the other filter feeders, they also ingest them. So very early, very lower level in the food chain, in the marine food chain, they are consumed. Zooplankton, microscopic zooplankton, they are also found to ingest microplastic the green green dots that you can see in this zooplankton is ingested by the zooplankton maybe they have confused them the small particles they have confused them with the phytoplankton they eat and that is why they have they have ingested this these part uh, plastics very tiny pieces well large animals like whales also have been found in the coast that and a huge the predator whale have found a huge plastics ingested and died so tiny small animals to the large animals in the sea none of them are safe from the plastic pollution well now coming to my research if you remember the the global uh, map of the plastic pollution that we have seen in the in the beginning of this microplastic discussion, we have seen that the the Ganges estuary in of Bangladesh coast has a pollution of twenty thousand to around ninety thousand particles per square kilometer, and from our research that we have done along the Cox's Bazaar coast, particularly in the Barkhali River estuary, we have found exactly the figure in between 20 to 90,000. But we have also researched on the plastic particles in the sea beaches, and we have found as high as 67.6 .6 plastic particle per meter square in the in the sea beaches um, in, in Cox's Bazaar. Well, there are low pollutions as well, but there are high pollutions like this as well. Well, when we have in, investigated uh, crude salt from the same region from the Cox's was a region of the Bay of Bengal. The salt is produced drying seawater, and we have we have found as as high as twelve hundred particles of plastics per kilogram of crude salt. And this crude salt is a source of our table salt, is a source of our salt that we use our in our industry for producing different products, uh, food products, processed food products. So this is ultimately coming to our food. We have also, uh, this year, uh, we have also investigated the Cornofoli River, a coastal river in in the south uh, eastern coast of Bangladesh. And I'm sharing only the bottom sediment sample investigation from, from this river. And we have found that uh, as high as um, around 180, particles per kilogram of sediments from the sea bottom, indicating a significant pollution, uh, plastic pollution accumulating on uh, the river bottom. Uh, this is a coastal river that is regularly influenced by the coastal tides. Well, we have done some FTA analysis of uh, microplastic samples to try to understand the chemical property of the microplastics and we have found uh, some of the active ingredients that are um, composing these plastics. So this table actually tells more about what are the different um, polyethylene or other similar kinds of ingredients that are used in the plastics that we have found from, uh, from the sea, that we have some from the seawater or salt or um, bottom sediments that we have sampled from the bare bundle waters. 
And recently we have investigated the gut content of fish that are collected from the coastal marine waters, uh, particularly um, the coastal waters uh, of the Bay of Bengal, two species. One is a catfish, this one um, is Mr. Scoliu, and another is uh, the small pelagic fish. And in this small pelagic fish, this one, very delicious one, as high as 550 plastics per kilogram of body weight has been found in this small fish. And remember, these fish, the gut is not cleaned properly before it is cooked. It is just the gut content is just briefly with a with this with a brief with a gentle push of the thumb. It, it, it got content, it extruded and and washed and, and then it's cooked. So it is very possible that a, a portion of the microplastic ingested by this fish is in its stomach, which is actually eaten by us the, the, as a fish uh, when it is cooked and we are ingesting these plastics by ingestion of fish. So many fishes we actually consume from the sea are actually bringing back the plastic that we have polluted. And at last, what I can say is that our oceans, our seas, our aquatic habitats are invaluable resources of nature. And for for use very useful on many aspects for humankind and we must we must preserve them and this preservation this conservation this purification of the sea requires a lot of steps a lot of integrations of actions to be taken sometimes transboundary programs to be taken international regional programs to be taken to preserve the invaluable resources that we have for us thank you very much and thanks for patience hearing if you have any question you're welcome to ask questions uh, well sir stop the sharing please Well, now we are entering our question answering session. I am offering Mr. Rashidul Islam to host this session. Thank Mr. Rashid, Rashidul Islam, yes. Uh, thank you, Jahin Kondagar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our answer question session. I am Rashidul Islam from Octopin Society. I would like to give thanks to our honorable professor, Dr. Harun Roshi sir, for his wonderful and resourceful presentation. You're welcome. Curiosity is the basement to learn new things. And we have got so many questions from you, QS participants. Sir, we have to answer many of questions. Here you go. First question is from Nawaj. His question is, what is the main function of convention current? Sir. Uh, is it something that I have discussed today? I think yeah, you have shown some uh, current, uh, so polar current. That's why uh, someone asked this one. Okay, okay. Uh, okay, I think, yeah, I got your question. So, the, the solar radiation that we get, that I have discussed, uh, is the, that that creates a differences in the in, in the temperature of world ocean the the equator the, the, that is heated more than the other other parts of the of the of the earth that upwells that helps upwells the warmer water just at the equator that divides the world into two portions and 
due to the spinning of the earth, this, the centrifugal force that we get on the north and south pole, the upwells light of water is then pulled towards, um, towards the two poles of the ocean. And this creates a large whirlpool. And the function of this conversion current that I have already mentioned is to transport heat from equator to the polar region, trying to balance uh, the heat of the valve ocean. And at the same time, trying to help the far distant place from the equator to bring higher temperature. And that is how a large part of our sea and large part of the seashores are warmer, which are far from the equator and bringing uh, a livable place for us. That is my answer. Thank you for asking this. Thank you, sir. I, question, I think please. he got the point. Yeah. The second question is asked by Mr. Shajib, which marine products that kills novel coronavirus? Uh, well, it was actually a computational bioinformatics study. Uh, I don't have a very detail on this product. It was, um, but if you want to learn, you can learn it from the article that is referred here. I have not gone into the detail of this product, but you can learn from this. Um, but it potentially has the inhibition and killing property towards novel coronavirus based on okay, the computational, computational studies. So since I will share this slide with you, I think you can learn more from this slide. Uh, we think we should provide after uh, this session. Thank and you. we should go third questions from uh, Osama Abu Libda. He asked that, have geoengineering solution have acknowledged so far as viable option for encountering ocean acidity and elevated temperature? So, uh, could you please repeat the question? Yes, sir, of course. Have geoengineering solution been acknowledged so far as viable options for encounter ocean acidity and elevated ocean temperature? Uh, I think he asking about the encountering ocean acidity and temperature uh, increase. Well, well, uh, he's asking about the geoengineering solutions. Well, I'm not a geologist. Um, I'm a marine biologist. First of all, I cannot completely answer what is going on there, but um, there are some programs which are actually going on um, to address uh, to address ocean global carbon dioxide um, removal. I don't know how they are uh, planning to do that, but there are, I think, some uh, geoengineering solutions maybe going on on um, ocean global carbon dioxide removal. Uh, there are some groups working on this. But, but it is always, um, it is always imp uh, better to have solutions uh, to have preventive measures against the carbon dioxide emission than removing them once they are already in the environment. Thank you. Okay, sir, thank you. The next question is from uh, Shorab Chandra Dev. He is asking, how oxygen helps in keeping ocean water cool? How oxygen helps? Um, I don't know whether oxygen has any role in ocean cooling, but what I told is somewhat different. I told that when the cooler the water, the more oxygen it will be um, a hole by the water. The warmer the water, it will emit oxygen and other gases. This is a simple physics, a property of the aqueous phases. That is what I mentioned. But I don't know whether oxygen has any role in cooling the water. I don't know. Thank you. Okay, sir. The next question is from Nusrat Jahan Tarim. She is asking, is sea level rising globally or regionally? Well, it's rising globally, but there are regional differences. So sea level rise is a global event, but there are differences in different regions. Thank you. Okay. 
Yes, sir. Uh, we are moving forward for the next question from the foreign one. Uh, Lucas Vega, he is ask, asking that, is there any method to clean toxic algal blooms? And uh, any innovations to control the algal It's difficult. It's in the ocean. So once it is spread, uh, it's difficult. Well, of course, in the lakes, uh, there are also toxic algal bloom events, which you can sometimes uh, try to remove. But in the oceans, once it is bloom, it is difficult to remove. Thank you. Yes. Next question, please. From the next question, Pato Bonik. Uh, so he, he is asking, due to COVID-19 pandemic, the Bay of Bengal can restore its natural characteristics. At that time, what will be the government initiative to minimize the previous status of pollution in Bay of Bengal? Well, it's, uh, it, it's a big answer question, actually. <clears throat> of course, the, the COVID situation is helping the nature, so as it is helping uh, the oceans <clears throat> with respect to pollution. And uh, what I think every country should now uh, has a scope to compare uh, the, the status of the ocean, their productivities compared to the pre-COVID situation. And if they analyze, they will find that yes, it's better now. Uh, the productivity, the aesthetics, the tourism uh, potential there, um, the marine productivity that we are getting from the oceans is, is much better compared to the pre-COVID situation. And, and this is because the nature is correcting itself with the less interference of humans. So these, can, these comparisons can be translated into policies by the governments to, to see how they can, they can actually sustain this, uh, this situation and even try to improve better the situation. Thank you. Next question, please. Yes, sir. Uh, from the Shujib uh, Namok, he is asking, is coral reefs phase shift happens due to climate change? What could be the possible negative side of these events? Uh, so his question is, is coral reefs are being destroyed by the climate change? Is this the question? Uh, phase shift happens, yes, sir. Okay, the coral, yes, corals are being destroyed. Um, because of the climate change and both the temperature and carbon dioxide, both of them together are responsible for uh, the, the destruction of corals. Um, both of them, they have influence on the, that I mentioned in my, in my lecture, they have influence on the symbiotic relations of the coral animal and the symbiotic phytoplankton. The phytoplankton, due to these shocks that withdraw fr from the coral colony, so which is called coral bleaching. And at the same time, the already formed coral calcareous structure is destroyed by ocean acidification. So together, the corals are in destruction. And if uh, the climate change goes on as, uh, as it is, then there will be huge loss of corals in the years coming. Thank you. Next question, please. Okay, sir. Uh, it is in addition uh, about the coral leaves. Uh, one question from coral leaves. Uh, he has seen lots of coral bleached and washed out. And is there any pre uh, prevent, uh, preventive measure of bleaching? There is no prevention. The only prevention is the helping the climate, helping the climate less pollute with the climate gases and trying to uh, bring the, the global emission of climate gases as low as possible, including the carbon dioxide, which is actually again responsible for uh, ocean acidification and destruction of corals. Thank you. Next question, please. Okay, sir. Uh, Mahmoudul Hassan, he is asking how pesticides affect the sea fishes or other marine life? Well, <clears throat> as from our research, we have seen that fishes, every stage of fish, starting from embryonic larval to adulthood, there are consequences on the life history traits, their life history events, 
like refraction and hatching, and internal organs, death, deformities, low fertility rates. So these will have consequences on, on overall productivity on estuarine and coastal and marine fishery. So definitely, there are impacts, as we can see from the laboratory evidences. Thank you. Next question, please. Yes, sir. Another question from pesticide uh, from uh, Sarah Kopennar. Are these deformities linked to one specific pesticide or by a mix of pesticides? Well, in my study um, that I have supervised, we have done single pesticide effects on single species, but there are studies done by other scientists where they have started on multi pesticides, on multi species, on microcosm and mesocosm levels, and there are effects at community level as well, together with impacts on individual organisms. So, multiple pesticide cocktails that can exert even more effects at community level in the ecosystem. Thank you. Next question, please. Thank you, sir. I think she got the point. Another question from Hassan Jaman Noor. He is asking, can cypermethrin affects the embryo of marine fishes too? Of course, as from the evidence with fish, not only the fish that we have studied, but also my colleagues have studied with other fish. So the, the different stages of life, life history stages of fish that we can see in the laboratory, definitely they will impact marine, uh, marine fishes, particularly uh, the, the estuarine fishes where um, many fishes are fishes nursery grounds are there in the estuary and coast. There will be more effects of these uh, pesticides compared to the sea. To the early stages and critical life stages like the gravid females and males. Thank you. Next question, please. Another question from microplastic. Sir, microplastics uh, can be degraded by some bacteria. What types of bacteria is this? I don't know. Okay. Sir, can I'm not a microbiologist. Thank you. Okay, sir. <laughs> uh, is there any prospects of this in Bangladesh for innovative uh, action? Um, which, which one? The prospect of? Uh, to, uh, to generate that, that bacteria to degrade uh, microplastic or plastics. Well, is of course, the microbiologists, uh, they have environmental microbiologists in particular. They have a lot of things to do, including the finding out solutions for microplastic pollution, finding out the microorganisms that can degrade microplastics, definitely that will be an environmental solutions for some of the, uh, some of the microplastic pollution, uh, definitely. Thank you. Next question, please. Okay, sir. Uh, from Mamun Sajid, uh, he is asking, normally agro-pesticide enters into the aquatic system through surface runoff. How can we minimize this pesticides exposure to save the aquatic life? Well, as you can see, uh, some of the countries, including the country where Mamun Sajid is from, uh, Bangladesh, is already using 10 to 15 times the, the pesticide uh, of, of global average and, and, and as investigated by the recent studies. So if we use a proper dose of pesticide for crop protection, that will reduce a lot of pesticide use into our crops, and that will reduce a lot of pesticide that ultimately goes to the sea. So the policy and policy implications with science is very important. Thank you very much for this nice question. Next question, please. Uh, thank you, that's all. Thank you, Professor, for your informative answers. Hope they all have understood and got the points and your amazing presentation. Uh, delighted us and thank you all dear participants for connecting with thank us you. and for your passion finally, thank you very much i also finally, enjoyed this presentation thank you okay sir okay sir uh, finally well, we are in the last moments of our online class due to time limitation we didn't cover all the questions please stay connected in our facebook group you will find all your answer in comment section stay safe stay healthy best to it for all thank you well, thank you, Mr. Rashidul Islam. Thank you, dear Professor Dr. Harunur Rashid.
for this lively session and also thanks for staying with Octofin. Thanks to all participants. Stay safe, stay tuned, stay with Octofin. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye, sir. Goodbye. Thank you very much.